Welcome back to chapter 25 in module 6. In this video we're going to talk about a couple more sections out of the chapter and make sure we understand how we can measure the total mass content of the Milky Way galaxy. Now part of this goes back all the way to chapters 2 and 3 in OpenStax Astronomy. When we learned about Kepler's laws of planetary motion and Isaac Newton's universal law of gravitation. When we look at the stars in the galaxy, all of the stars in the disk of the galaxy, they all rotate in the same flat plane. And they do so in a way that is very similar to the planets in our solar system. And we'll be making that comparison on the next slide as well. The stars that are in the halo of the Milky Way and in the central bulge region of the galaxy, they actually have much more chaotic orbits, so much more um, elliptical and tilted in different ways, very similar to um, the outer regions of our solar system that we'll be learning about in Module 7. But on galactic scales, what this tells us is something about the formation history of the galaxy. And it's something that we'll be thinking more about in the next video. But what we want to concentrate on right now is the fact that these orbits are happening because of gravity. The same exact equation of gravity that we discussed in Chapter 3 the force of gravity is that capital G, the universal law, um, the universal constant for gravitation. The big mass times the small mass all over the distance squared. The only thing that makes it a little more complex for our galaxy is that what we need to include for the big mass is all of the material interior to the orbit itself. When we think about our solar system, the solar system is fairly straightforward. Since 99.8% of the mass in the solar system is contained within the sun, that's a fact that we'll um, remind ourselves of or learn um, in module seven coming up. Most of the mass of our entire solar system, that little pocket of stuff that is our sun and everything else that orbits our sun, most of that mass is at the sun itself, which means that when Kepler came up with this idea that the farther away we are, the slower we go, he was completely correct because it's basically just the same amount of mass and we're making the distance bigger and bigger. So the farther away we are, the less force of gravity we're experiencing. When we plot planetary data, then we get this curve of Mercury, Venus, Earth, Earth is uh, colored in blue instead of black points, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, we see this curve come down where the farther away we are, the slower those planets are moving. That's what we expect if we are getting farther and farther away from the same amount of material. When we look at the rotation curve for the galaxy, though, things get a little more complex. The red here is showing that throughout the central bulge region, the reason why orbits get faster is because there's so many stars in that central region that as you go farther out, you're actually orbiting way more mass than you were a moment ago. The force of gravity is still getting stronger because you're adding more and more mass. But eventually that starts to drop off. The reason it picks up again is because these spiral arms are kind of denser regions. So as you encompass a new spiral arm, you now are orbiting more mass than you were before. And so we get this kind of several bumps um, shown. But at about this distance here, uh, about 14 or 15 kiloparsecs, we now get to the edge of the disk, the disk of material that has all of the gas and dust and most of the stars. 
And so what we expect from that point is to have a drop-off just like we saw for the solar system. The blue here is what we expect from a Keplerian type of rotation curve where we're just getting farther and farther away from the same amount of mass because we don't see any more stars to include in those orbits. And yet what we have instead is a curve that flattens out or even gets a little bit bigger as we get farther and farther away from the center of the galaxy, well outside of the regular disk. What this shows us then is that there is mass in the halo of the Milky Way galaxy that is not visible. So if it's not visible mass, what might we call that? Some of you may have heard this term from well before this class. All right, if you guessed dark matter, you are absolutely correct. The rotation curve of the Milky Way galaxy and all major galaxies shows this same relationship of a huge amount of mass in the outer halo regions that we can't see any light coming from. This was the first and is still one of the most important pieces of evidence for what we call dark matter. Later on in this unit, we will talk about what dark matter is able to be and what it cannot be, but that's a discussion that we're going to save for chapter 29. For now, we want to recognize that the rotation curve of the Milky Way is one of the most important um, pieces of evidence, one of the most important observations that clued us in to the fact that dark matter exists, and it was Vera Rubin who was so instrumental in that. Just for your um, kind of trivia knowledge, not numbers we have to memorize, the mass of material in the Milky Way disk is about 400 billion solar masses. There are hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. But when you include the mass in the disk and in the larger halo, when you include the dark matter, we more than double the amount of mass. We go to a trillion solar masses of material that we can account for using gravity, um, even though we're not counting it with light that we're receiving from it. So it's a really big difference, and it's really important for us to recognize. Okay, so that's the overall mass of the entire galaxy that we figured out using the idea of orbits and gravity, we can also use the idea of orbits and gravity to find out what's going on in the very, very center part of our Milky Way galaxy, in the galactic center or galactic nucleus. When we zoom in real close on the center of our galaxy, we can't use visible light because there are huge amounts of dust clouds between us and the center, but when we use uh, radio wavelengths and other um, long wavelengths that can kind of peer through the dust, we see objects orbiting something at the very, very center. The object at the very center of the galaxy gets the name Sagittarius A star. So it's abbreviated in writing as SGR A asterisk, and it's often abbreviated in words as Sag A star. You're welcome to click on the link. Um, I'm not going to have it in our YouTube playlist, but you're welcome to click on the link here to see basically the data set shown on the slide, but as an animation over years of time. But every single one of these objects where the points are showing um, observations and the orbit color coded in different colors is showing us what we were able to figure out from Newton's um, equations that came up in chapter three. Every single one of those orbits is an independent measurement of how much mass Sagittarius A star has. And each of those independent measurements is telling us that that object has over four and a half million solar masses of material. It is still a tiny, tiny fraction of the overall mass of the galaxy, 4 million compared to 400 billion solar masses, but 
that amount of mass is crammed down into a region that is less than 0.3 astronomical units across. That number might not mean that much to us, but imagine taking four and a half million times the amount of mass the sun has and squashing it down into a region that is smaller than the orbit of Venus, smaller than our solar system by far. The only type of object in astronomy that can have that kind of density is a black hole. But this is a supermassive black hole. It's a different type of black hole than the thing we talked about in chapter 24, and it absolutely cannot have formed from a single dead star dying and leaving its core behind. So we need to recognize that although this is also an object that has kind of broken the laws of physics in some region out inside of a event horizon, we can still think of the Schwarzschild radius and the event horizon and all of this kind of thing, but this is not formed in the same way that stellar mass black holes are. And in fact, it's still an ongoing source of study for how these things are formed in the first place. There are several different hypotheses, and we aren't going to go through them in our curriculum. We just don't have the, the time for it. Um, but you can read through this portion of the textbook to get a couple more details and some links that might take you to that. So we're going to leave off this video here. We've talked about how much mass the galaxy has. And in the last video for chapter 25, we're going to talk about how the galaxy formed. So I will see you in that next video.